Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome. I am Andres Velasco. I am the Dean of the School of Public Policy at the LSE. And today we are very lucky to welcome Michael Sandel, one of the world's leading political philosophers, who is the Anne and Robert Bass Professor of Government at Harvard, and where he teaches what is probably, or at least has been in the past, the most popular course at Harvard College. Professor Sandel has written widely on theories of justice, on the moral limits to markets, and he has just released a new book that is going to present uh, to us tonight uh, called The Tyranny of Merit. As you can guess from the title, the book is a critique of the use and abuse of merit and meritocracy, particularly in the United States. It is a philosophical book, but it has a political conclusion that uh, an arrogant uh, new meritocratic class looks down upon and demeans working class Americans, and this helps explain the rise of right-wing populism, and in particular, of Donald Trump. I can say that Michael has produced not only a thought-provoking uh, set of arguments, but also a very readable book. If uh, philosophers everywhere wrote as clearly, it would be a better world out there, I think. <laughs> Um, we're going to ask our guest to give us a brief account uh, of the main ideas, the main thesis of his book. Then we will have a conversation and uh, then in turn we will open it up to uh, questions from the audience. So let us get started. Michael, the floor is yours. And again, thanks uh, for joining us at the LSE. Thank you, Andres. Thank you so much for having me. The the full title of my book, The Tyranny of Merit, includes the subtitle, which points towards some hope. What has become of the common good? And what I suggest in the book, that there is a tension between the embrace of meritocracy, the principle of merit, which on its face seems an attractive principle, and the possibility of creating a politics that aims at the common good. Let me explain how I got there and, and what prompted me to write the book. In 2016, with Brexit in Britain, the election of Trump in the United States, and the rise of authoritarian populist movements and politicians in many countries, the question arose, why? What accounts, not only for the rise of this authoritarian populism, but also for the deep divisions, the polarization, the rancor that afflicts our politics in democratic societies? I wanted to try to make some sense of this. And there have been many explanations, but I think we've been missing one important part of an account. And that has to do with changing attitudes towards success and failure that have accompanied the deepening inequality that came about over the past four decades as the result of a market-driven version of globalization. Now we're familiar with the fact of the deepening inequality in many of our societies, inequalities of income and wealth. Most of the benefits, most of the economic growth produced by the version of global globalization that we've seen in recent decades have gone to the top, those at the top 10 or 20% of the income scale. Those at the middle or in the bottom half of our societies have not fared well. Their wages have stagnated. And more than that, they sense that the work they do is no longer recognized or valued. Now, why should this be? Well, if we step back and look at the last four decades, we see that the divide between winners and losers has deepened, not only because of the inequality, 
but because of changing attitudes towards success. Somehow those who, who've landed on top have come to believe that their success is their own doing and that they therefore deserve all the material rewards that the market showers upon them. And by implication, that those left behind, those who are struggling, must deserve their fate as well. This way of thinking about success arises from a seemingly attractive principle. If everyone starts out with an equal chance, then those who succeed deserve the rewards their talents bring. This is the heart of the meritocratic ideal. Now, in practice, of, sure, uh, of course, we fall short of this ideal. Chances are not truly equal. Children born poor tend to stay poor as adults, certainly in the US and in many democratic societies. And parents, affluent parents, have figured out how to pass their advantages onto their kids. So we live in highly imperfect meritocratic societies. But there's a deeper problem. The problem is not only that we fail, fail to live up to the meritocratic principles we profess, the ideal itself is flawed. It has a dark side. And the dark side is that meritocracy is corrosive of the common good. Let me see if I can explain why. The attitudes towards success and failure that I've just described lead to hubris among the winners and to humiliation for those who lose out. It encourages the successful to inhale too deeply of their success, to, to forget the luck and good fortune that helped them on their way. And it leads them to look down on those less fortunate, less credentialed than themselves. One of the most potent sources of the populist backlash against elites is the sense among many working people that elites look down on them. This, it seems to me, is a legitimate complaint. Because the, the elites, the meritocratic elites, the governing elites, who saw the rising inequality, offered a solution to it in line with the meritocratic ideal. They said, the way to deal with the inequality brought about by globalization is for more and more people, especially those who want to move up, to get a university degree so that they can rise as individuals, so that they can compete and win in the global economy. This was the advice. It was a, it was a proposal to deal with inequality through individual mob upward mobility through a college education. That was the offer. But what this meritocratic offer missed though it's attractive in one way, it's encouraging more people to go to college and that in itself is a good thing. But embedded in that offer, in that promise of solving inequality through individual mobility, embedded in that promise was an insult, an inadvertent insult, which was, if you find yourself struggling in the new economy, and if you didn't go to college, your failure must be your fault. You have no one to blame but yourself. This was the, the hidden insult implicit in the meritocratic way of trying to address the deepening inequality of globalization. 
and a great many, and, and we heard this slogan of upward mobility through education as the solution to inequality. We heard this a lot solution from across the political spectrum, from center right and center left, politicians in democracies around the world. But it's lost its capacity to inspire. And by 2016, its time was up. That's when we saw that the accumulated anger and resentment against this sense of meritocratic elites looking down issued in the populist backlash. And we're still contending with the consequence for our politics today. So what should we do about it? Should we give up on, on the idea of encouraging people to go to college and to broadening access to university? No, broadening access to university is a good thing. But what I think we should give up is the idea that the primary answer to inequality is to encourage individual mobility through a university diploma. We should remember, after all, that in the US and in Britain and in most European countries, most people don't have a four-year university degree. The majority don't. So designing an economy that creates, that sets as a necessary condition for dignified work and a decent life, a, a four-year university diploma, that's a recipe for frustration and anger and resentment for a great many people. What we need to do, I think, is to shift from this meritocratic emphasis on dealing with inequality through individual mobility and ask a different question. How can we reconfigure the economy to make life better for everyone, whether or not they have a university degree? How can we renew the dignity of work so that the economy rewards and also recognizes the contributions whether or not those contributions are made by people in the professional classes or in the financial industry. This moment of pandemic is a good time to rethink the meritocratic hubris that has come to inform the public culture. Because suddenly we recognize that those of us who are able to work remotely, to work at home, to have meetings and lectures on Zoom, we all depend, we deeply depend on the work, on the contributions of a great many working people. I don't just mean the people who are in the hospital caring for those who have contracted COVID, but I'm thinking of, of delivery workers, warehouse workers, grocery store clerks, home health care providers childcare workers, lorry drivers. We depend on them and we're calling them now key workers, essential workers. And sometimes we put up signs and banners thanking them. And sometimes we clap for them in the evening. But the question I think we should ask is if these are truly key workers, what should we do about the fact that they are not the most the best paid or, or the most honored workers in our economy? What can we do to bring their pay, but also their recognition, their social recognition into better alignment with the work they do? So that's one of the projects, the political projects to which this experience of pandemic points us. And I think we also need to address the attitudes themselves, the meritocratic hubris of the successful. We need to ask or to invite the successful in our society to ask, is it really true that our success is our own doing? 
Or is it instead the case that we are deeply indebted to family, to teachers, to community, to country? Deeply indebted for the resources, the capacities, the inspiration, the opportunities that enable us to flourish. Believing that our success is our due makes it hard to picture ourselves, to see ourselves in other people's shoes. Appreciating the role of luck in life enables us to say and to believe there, but for the accident of birth or the luck of the draw or the grace of God there, that could have been me. So appreciating the role of luck in life and especially in success can prompt a certain humility. An important antidote to the meritocratic hubris that drives us apart. This kind of humility, Andres, I think is the civic virtue we need now. It can point us beyond the tyranny of merit toward a less rancorous, more generous public life. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, those last words are particularly uplifting. We certainly need a more generous and less rancorous public life everywhere, certainly in the US and in the UK. Uh, we have people watching uh, from many countries. Um, here's the list, India, Argentina, Nigeria, Brazil, Malta, Thailand, Bangladesh, and uh, the countries from which you are listening in keep adding up. So thank you everybody for joining us tonight. I'm going to um, use my chair's privilege to, uh, to chat here with Michael for a little bit and then we will open it up to questions. It seems to me, Michael, that a way of summarizing your book is to say that you make two different arguments. One is purely empirical. You say we do not live up to the ideal of meritocracy because after all, a place like Harvard is open and competitive, but the people who get in tend to be children of privilege anyway. I think that claim could have been controversial 10 years ago. Today, it is fairly widely acceptable. Right. But then you make a second claim that is uh, more radical, if you want. Um, and you say, I'm going to quote here, a perfect meritocracy banishes all sense of gift or grace. It diminishes our capacity to see ourselves as sharing a common fate. And you go on and on listing things that make meritocracy bad. And you conclude this is what makes merit a kind of tyranny. So I, the question I want to ask you at the outset is, is this inevitable in some, in some general sense? Is, is it sort of a philosophical conclusion about, about human nature or about the way we relate to one another? Or is it a more limited conclusion that arises from the particular ways in which meritocracy has grown and is practiced in America today? Which, which one of the two is it in your mind? Well, it's certainly the second, and I would not say it's only uh, the way it's practiced in America today. I think this is true in, in, in most uh, democratic societies that have embraced mm -hmm. the market-driven ver market version of globalization that we've seen unfold for the past four decades. I think it's, it's uh, a claim generally about those democratic societies. And I think that the version of meritocracy that goes along with, that has accompanied what some would call neoliberal globalization or market-based globalization is one in which we fall into the tendency to assume that the money people make is the measure of their contribution to the common good. Because if we didn't believe that, we would have no reason to honor and valorize as deserving or meritorious the people who do well in a global economy. 
so closely connected to the market faith that has animated the version of globalization that's played out in recent decades is this moral assumption. Or you could call it a philosophical assumption to go to, to your question, Andres. And it's this way of conceiving merit, a market defined merit that I think is objectionable in principle. Uh, I do think it happens to be widespread. So it's the philosophical claim is not altogether detached from observing how, how things have gone in democracies these days. Our civic life is not going very well. People agree and have long recognized that inequalities have deepened in recent decades. And what I'm suggesting to add to that picture to explain the depth of the rancor and the resentment and the backlash is that accompanying this inequality has been this assumption about merit, that markets define meritorious contribution, that it, here's another way of putting it. If we really wanted to bring about a society that rewarded people it can materially, but also in terms of honor and recognition that rewarded people in accordance with their real contribution to the common good, then we would have to debate what counts. We'd have to have a public debate. What counts as a, as a truly valuable contribution to the common good? For example, if we go by the market's verdict, then people who engage in say high-speed trading in the city, speculative finance, even speculative finance that is pretty far removed from any actual investment in the real economy. And that's a good portion of financial activity. We would have to conclude that the market is right in telling us that their contribution is thousands of times more valuable than that of a school teacher or a care worker. But morally, that doesn't seem plausible. So part of the problem is that we have outsourced our judgment about what counts as a truly meritorious contribution to the common good, to markets. And so the, there's been a kind of unholy alliance between the market faith on the one hand and meritocratic assumptions about success on the other. So is this an empirical claim or a philosophical one? Well, I think it is at least in part philosophical because it's directing our attention to our uh, to misjudging of the way we allocate material rewards, but also social recognition and esteem. Does that, does that address what you were getting at, Andres? It, it certainly does. Um, and let me stay with the subject for a minute. I, yeah. I, I will turn back to the issue of globalization and markets in yeah. a minute. But, but just to stay with your fascinating critique of, of merit, um, you know, you mount a pretty withering critique of, uh, uh, of the risks of, of, of meritocracy. But you also provide in the book an account, a historical account of the idea of merit and how persistence, how persistent, sorry, it has been throughout history. Right. The Protestant Reformation was supposed to be um, a revolt against the idea that you have to do good things to go to heaven. Salvation yeah. is supposed to come from predestination. And nonetheless, you know, the Protestant ethic became the ethic of capitalism. You, you right. point out that center-left politicians in recent years in the UK and the US, people like Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, Tony Blair, uh, very much espoused this, um, this logic that uh, a good society, a society that will allow you to go as far as your talents will take you, et cetera. Yeah. So might it not be, given this long history of meritocracy being so hard to kill, so to speak, might it not be that there's something uh, about meritocra meritocracy that is sort of wired into us? We like the idea that our success is our own doing. We like right. the idea that uh, we enjoy autonomy and therefore we get to, to choose what we do and we're rewarded uh, by those choices. So by criticizing meritocracy or the role of merit, are we not walking down sort of a blind alley and that this is something that is going to be around because it is very much part of human nature? Right. Yeah, thank you for that. That's a good question, Andres. 
not a blind alley, no, but an alley fraught with uh, moral complexity, yes. Not a blind alley for the following reason. You've identified very well just now the deepest allure of the meritocratic ideal. A actually, there are two aspects to that persistent allure. One of them, as you point out, is the idea that it's connected with a certain conception of freedom. It's the idea that my fate is not determined by my circumstance or my accident of birth. My fate is in my hands. I can strive and I can rise thanks to my own efforts and my own talents. I can be, I can make my fate, so to speak. I can be the author of my lot in life. And that, you're right, that has been a persisting in, uh, allure. It's inspiring, this idea of freedom as self-making, self-mastery of my fate even in life. And yet, there is, oh, and connected to that, that appeal is the idea that if, if that's true, if I really am the master of my fate, if I am self-sufficient and self-making, such that my success is my own doing, then I deserve it. So the second appeal is the idea that desert matches achievement. So this is what has long attracted people to this picture. But, and this is, you could call it a radical claim or thoroughgoing philosophical critique, either way. The claim in the book is that this picture of freedom is inadequate to the human condition. You're right, Andres, we are drawn to it. The idea that we could be ultimately the masters of our destiny, of our fate, such that the role of luck or indebtedness to others, or even the grace of God to go back to the early religious debate, have no claim on me. And yet we find that when we try to live according to this idea of self-mastery, exhilarating though it is, we find that it's unsatisfying. And we find ourselves noticing that the way life turns out when lived by this ideal of freedom does not actually align rewards with true achievement. We also find that it leaves us without appreciation of the sense in which we are indebted for our life circumstance, for whatever success we're able to achieve, to the communities that shape us. And so this picture of freedom ultimately casts us adrift. It also is a public philosophy unravels the social bonds that hold societies together. Because what it says is, insofar as this is what it means to exercise freedom, well, the winners deserve their place and the losers deserve theirs. And this is a recipe for disharmony and polarization and resentment and grievance. And if it sounds familiar, this is the world in which we live. This is the world that's been brought about by too thoroughgoing, too single-minded, a political project based on this admittedly alluring ideal. And this is why, despite its appeal, the meritocratic idea is deeply corrosive of the common good, of common purposes and ends, of a sense of indebtedness, of a sense of sharing one another's fate. It's antithetical ultimately to the idea of what we owe one another as citizens. And so what I'm arguing for in the book by identifying this tyrannical turn that an attractive principle can take is a different kind of political project. 
an antidote to meritocratic hubris, a greater sense of identification with the common good, a greater appreciation of the role of luck in life, a greater appreciation of what we owe to our fellow citizens for our success, which would point us, I think, away from this unraveling, it, it would be the beginning, the, the only way we can try to repair, I would put it this way, Andres, the only way we can begin to repair the social bonds that have come unraveled during the age of market faith and merit is by this, by trying to cultivate this greater sense of humility, a greater sense of solidarity to move us toward a politics of the common good. And that's the argument of the book. Michael, you, you articulate very clearly, and you just did, why uh, the idea that merit rules can be divisive, that can tear society apart. But people also argue the opposite side of that equation by pointing out that in societies that are very unfair, and many societies, maybe all societies are, the one thing that holds a community or a country together is precisely the dream that even though you started out at the bottom, uh, if you work hard and if you will do well, you can rise. Right. So one could construct uh, uh, an, uh, an account of merit and met meritocracy, a social glue, not as a source of a social division. And the reason why I said that is not purely conceptual. One thing that may be slightly uneasy while reading your book is that I was not quite sure, and this takes me back to my first point, whether it was an account of populism in America and the UK or worldwide. Because today we have right-wing populism in Brazil and in India and in Turkey and in the Philippines. And in those countries, of course, I'm going to generalize unfairly here because those are you know, very, very different countries. First of all, you do not have a rise of the Ivy League arrogant elite to the same extent you do in the US and the UK. And um, those are countries with a middle class that is beginning to rise over the last few decades. And the great source of pride in that rising middle class is precisely that they've done it on their own. Um, and nonetheless, even though the underlying sociology is so different, even though some of those countries did not embrace the market driven kind of globalization you have been describing, we also get right-wing uh, populist authoritarian types. Uh, and uh, you know the same is true in many other emerging and developing countries. So might it not be that in some countries, uh, the meritocratic dream plays the opposing role? And might it not be that out there beyond the Anglosphere, there are other reasons for the rise of uh, right-wing populism? I would certainly say that there are other sources and other impetuses toward right-wing populism. I'm not saying that this is the only factor. I am saying that it's um, a factor that has not been acknowledged and recognized sufficiently. And I would say not only in America and Britain, but in most European democracies as well, where we have seen the um, a turning against elites, especially elites associated with the project of neoliberal globalization. We see this in many European countries, not only in the US and in Britain, but you're certainly right if we look beyond the US, the UK and Europe, there are other sources of authoritarian populism. I would certainly agree with you about that. The question is whether the, an adequate alternative to those forces and to the frustrations that produce them is a meritocratic individual mobility. And I doubt that it is for the following reason. First, even if we take those societies that have experienced authoritarian populist movements and rule outside of the US, the UK, and Europe. Many of those societies, many of those populist authoritarian uh, movements and politicians have derived considerable political appeal and support by resisting 
or rebelling against the, the, the neoliberal version of globalization that has impacted those societies as well as societies in Europe and the US and the UK. And one feature in particular that has fueled, uh, one feature of the four decades of, of market-driven globalization that has fueled these appeals even outside the US, the UK, and Europe is the sense that national boundaries and national identities and pride should take a second place and should be gradually overcome, outgrown in order to embrace the more universalist, secular, cosmopolitan identities that many associated with a, a kind of free market um, version of globalization. So even when we look at some of the countries you've mentioned outside the US, UK, and Europe, part of the backlash is a backlash against that devaluation of national identity and, and, and pride and meaning that did come with these same, the, the same general picture of globalization. But I want to address the, uh, the other uh, part of your challenge, Andres, which is can't meritocracy, at least in those places, provide the alternative, provide a source, source of social glue, you said, to, to hold the society together, to build social cohesion. And my, my response would well be in two parts. First, removing barriers to achievement, whether they be barriers of class or caste or ethnicity or religion or race or gender, moving, removing those barriers is a good thing. It's an important thing. It's a noble mission. It's a necessary condition of a just society. That's clear. Equality of opportunity to rise, that's a good thing. But it is a remedial virtue, if I can call it that. Mm -hmm. it's, an only, it's only a remedial virtue. It is not an, by itself an adequate basis for a just society. And it's not by itself an adequate source of social cohesion and community. And the reason is, well, uh, along the lines that we've been discussing, the reason is that it encourages individual mobility as the predominant ethic. And it encourages a belief by the successful that their success is their own doing and therefore they're not indebted to the wider society. And that belief in itself makes it very hard to mobilize a society to act together for the sake of the common good. So at best, the notion of equality of opportunity for the sake of upward mobility is a remedial virtue. And of course, we should embrace that remedial virtue. But the further step is attributing moral desert to those who were able to rise once those barriers are removed. Because that attribution of moral desert is what leads the successful to inhale too deeply of their own success and to forget their obligation to the wider society. This is a fascinating conversation and we could stay on that point forever, but time is finite. So uh, against my instincts, I'm going to move on. Um, I'm looking at the questions that the audience has sent in, and many are about sort of solutions, alternatives, proposals. I'm going to add one point of my own, which is related to something, something else that you say in the book, and then uh, use one of the questions uh, on the chat here. You talk about, when you move to the solutions part of the book, you talk about uh, the need to move from an exclusive emphasis uh, on distributive justice to something that you call contributive justice, very much related to the idea you've just uh, developed of rewarding people for their virtuous contribution to society, not simply 
considering society virtues because the goodies are nicely distributed. You know, you, you, you wrote at length about this, this, this idea, of course, in previous books. Um, so my question is, how does contributive uh, just as a concept that allows us to find our way out of this? And in the same vein, um, a PhD student from Sheffield asks, your criticism of meritocracy and your emphasis on the common good seems to be fitting with Petit's, uh, Petit's civic republican model of democracy. Would you endorse civic modern republicanism as a helpful guide and an alternative to these ills that you've been describing? Well, thank you for both of those questions. And they are connected, just as you suggest, Andres. If one looks at the civic republican tradition, what matters to create a good society, to create a self-governing society, is to cultivate in citizens certain civic virtues. This is the idea right at the heart of the civic republican tradition. Mm -hmm. And among those civic virtues is the ability to deliberate with fellow citizens mm -hmm. as an equal about common purposes and ends, about how the society should be governed, about what counts as a just society. And we can't do this purely in the abstract as if in a philosophy lecture to be capable really of this kind of citizenship. And it's a more demanding notion of citizenship than purely market-based consumerist notions of citizenship. To be a free citizen on the civic Republican tradition is to share in self-rule and to be capable of deliberating in this way with a concern for the common good, which is why it depends on cultivating certain qualities of character that orient people to the common good. Now, the, the most powerful rival to the civic Republican conception of citizenship and of the common good is what might be called a consumerist conception of citizenship. According to this conception, to aim at the common good is to add up, to aggregate, each person's individual interests and preferences and to make policy on the basis of that concatenated set of preferences. It's a consumerist conception of citizenship because it takes people's preferences as they come, whatever they happen to be, however individuated, however noble, however base, and says the point of politics, of democratic politics, is to add them up and satisfy them as best we can collectively. But what this consumerist conception of democracy and the common good misses is the more aspirational, the formative aspect, the civic aspect of democratic life. And it also misses something else. Going back to what you asked me, Andres, about contributive justice. It encourages us, the consumerist conception of citizenship, to see ourselves first and foremost as consumers rather than as producers. But in our role as consumers, we don't really win public recognition and appreciation because we're simply consuming. We may help the GDP by our purchases but we're not contributing as consumers, except in that indirect way, bolstering aggregate demand, you say. It's only in our role as producers or contributors to the economy or more broadly to the common life, to the common good, that it's possible to create a structure of recognition and appreciation, honor and dignity. And this is what's missing in this moment. I think the reason so many working people in the US, in the UK, and in many European countries feel excluded is not just because of wage stagnation, not just because of widening 
inequality of income and wealth. It's also because of a lack of recognition of social esteem, which is why I think that we need to shift to an emphasis on contributive justice because that shift is in line with the politics focused on the dignity of work. It's focused on appreciating, valorizing, honoring the contributions that many people make, including, as I mentioned before, the key workers, the essential workers during the, the pandemic. So this is how I think the civic conception of citizenship, the more demanding notion, requires that we think of ourselves as more than just consumers. We have to think of ourselves as producers because by thinking of ourselves in that way, um, it's possible to focus more directly on this question of recognition, of honor, of social esteem. And this I think is one of the great gaps in our contemporary public life. I think that notion of uh, rediscovering the dignity and value of work is, is fascinating and promising. The econo economist in me uh, is tempted to add that uh, we are likely to live in the next few years and decades through a period in which human work will be very much uh, under siege because um, we're seeing already a big the drop in the demand for labor, certain kinds of labor. And of course, we're being told that robots will do, you know, much of the work we human beings do today. In response, some people are advocating a uh, universal basic income. Am I inferring correctly from your arguments of a minute ago that uh, a world in which we get a paycheck at the end of a month and in which work is no longer central to our lives is not a world that you would relish? Well, you've certainly identified a hesitation I have, a worry I have about a universal basic income. And that worry is compounded by the fact that many of its most ardent supporters are people in Silicon Valley who hope to invent the robots that will displace the jobs of a great many people. And their support for this, uh, for the UBI Mm -hmm. It's a little bit suspect because it feels a little bit as though they want to buy off uh, uh, political opposition to the robots that they will own. And so if that's the spirit in which the UBI is enacted, or if the UBI is funded by uh, disinvesting in public services and the safety net and the welfare state, as, as some have proposed, then I think it would be objectionable. But you were right to suggest that my emphasis on the dignity of work provides a further reason to be concerned about it. Because to take the dignity of work seriously is to recognize that work is about more than making a living. It's also about contributing to the common good, and winning recognition and esteem for doing so. And if that's right, then it's unclear uh, whether the UBI would be able to um, support the, uh, the dignity of all persons. Now, it might be argued that an advantage of the UBI, even from my point of view, would be to decommodify work, mm -hmm. to untether economic rewards from the, uh, from the labor market. And this would have the advantage, uh, possibly, of giving greater, uh, suggesting greater recognition for people who work very hard, but, but not in the labor market, raising children, for example or the work done in households or much care work. So there, there, you could make a case from my point of view, emphasizing that aspect, that possible effect of the UBI. But uh, I think we have to, before, before I would uh, endorse the UBI, I would wanna know in what spirit uh, it was being enacted because that would, I'm concerned with how attitudes toward dignity and mutual respect are shaped by the economy 
and by our economic arrangements. And so I, I would bring these questions to bear on any proposal for a UBI. On the question of esteem and on the question of how these cultural features are shaped, there are two questions from the audience. Uh, one person says that, yes, we have all come to realize that we owe much to aid workers and health workers uh, uh, and other first respondents. But how is it that we transform uh, the way we society treats them? Uh, those are cultural traits and they move slowly over time. How do you propose to make that change? And somebody along the same lines, um, Lee Edwards, an associate professor at the LSC says, meritocracy is a systemic issue embedded and woven into almost every area of life. How do you propose to begin to unpick its threads and develop a new system? There are aspects of it woven into our everyday life that lack the, the dark side that I've described. If I need a, a surgeon to perform a heart surgery on me or on a loved one, finding a very well qualified surgeon is exactly what I would do. So the idea of matching jobs and social roles to those well able to perform them is not objectionable as such. To the contrary, that's a good thing. The question is whether when it comes to the society as a whole, when it comes to allocating uh, power and influence in the capacity to govern, when it comes to allowing the market to become the measure of the value of our contribution to the common good, that's when the dark side of meritocracy emerges. So the first part of my answer would be to say, we need to carefully separate the perfectly legitimate and desirable uses of allocating jobs and roles based on qualifications from this broader governing picture that includes this, this notion of, of deservingness, as we discussed earlier, and that actually informs and distorts the way we are governed, including by outsourcing our moral judgments about the value of various contributions to markets. And now on the, the first part of the question, remind me if you could, Andres, the first question. The first question was about um, how is it that in practice we give oh, yeah. those health workers the respect that they deserve? Right, right, right. Okay, yes. And then the questioner pointed out the changes in attitudes um, come about slowly. Yes. So how can we begin, even if we agree we want to uh, reconfigure the economy and our attitudes to accord greater honor to those who perform essential but not well-paid work? How do we do that? Well, it, it's true that this is a slow process, but it's striking how this moment of pandemic has created an opening, I think, to make more rapid progress in this change of attitudes than we might have expected even a year ago. Sometimes crises can create openings for rethinking the way we organize the economy or the way we, uh, way we conceive our citizenship that would have been very difficult uh, in the absence of the crisis. At a time now when everyone recognizes how deeply dependent we are on key workers or essential workers, I think now is the time to begin a public debate about how to embody in the actual practices of our economy and the systems of reward the judgments that we are all making about the previously overlooked social importance of the work that um, these workers are performing. And so to carry this moment of clarity 
during the crisis into, into politics. I think that's one way in which attitudes begin to change. And then we can consider proposals, practical proposals to, uh, and people have suggested wage subsidies. People have suggested, uh, in the book, I have some suggestions about reconfiguring the tax system as a way of expressing a greater appreciation uh, for the work uh, done by essential workers. I think this should be the starting point for a debate about how to embody in policy the widespread sentiments we have that I think are gesturing in the right direction. Thank you, Michael. We have only a few minutes uh, left, uh, maybe time for one more question. Uh, again, in the domain of uh, solutions, if subcontracting our morals to the market, as you put it, is undesirable, the alternative you propose, and you do it very emphatically and enthusiastically, is that we move toward deliberating as a society on what constitutes the common good. Uh, as an academic who likes to debate, that seems very appealing. Uh, but in a previous life, I was a politician who tried to engage in that public debate. And my question to you would be, at a time in which half of the people in most countries do not show up to vote, in which what passes for debate over the social networks is nasty, brutish, and short, in which uh, polarization makes much public discourse uh, nasty, uh, aggressive, uh, and which drives many people away from the public sphere. What do we do? What is our recipe? How can we get that joint deliberation on the common good going? Uh, in a society and an environment that seems so ill-prepared for that? I think what accounts, Andres, for the impoverished public discourse that you have rightly just described is the fact that we are not engaging in our public discourse with big questions that people care about. This may also explain why in many societies, relatively a small proportion of the population votes, only half or even 60% in, in highly publicized elections. I think one of the reasons that people have turned away from, from politics, from voting and from engaging in public discourse is that it's so empty what passes for public discourse these days consists either of narrow technocratic managerial talk, which inspires no one and fails to engage the wider citizenry, or when passion does enter, we have shouting matches, ideological food fights in the floors of parliaments and congresses, people shouting past one another on social media and talk radio and 24 hour cable television news. So it's no wonder that citizens everywhere are frustrated with politics and with politicians and with the alternatives that are put before them. And I think this has contributed, this alienation, this disaffection this disempowerment of democratic citizens has contributed to the backlash that has so shocked mainstream politicians and political parties and that threatens to displace a good number of them. So there is no single recipe. You ask Andres for a recipe, but here's an approach. The, the approach, it seems to me, that we need is not to flee hard moral questions in politics, but to engage with them, to put questions of values right at the center of our public debate. These debates will be messy. They will be contested. They will be controversial. Debates about the meaning of a just society. What is the common good? What do we owe one another as citizens? What is the moral significance, if any, of national borders? These will be contentious 
questions precisely because they are questions about values. But outsourcing these questions either to technocrats, governing elites with their supposed expertise, or to markets is precisely what leaves ordinary democratic citizens feeling left out, feeling disempowered. So my suggestion, and this is the argument uh, uh, of the book ultimately, is to have a morally reinvigorated kind of public discourse that, quest, that addresses the big questions, including questions of values that citizens care about. And then let's see whether we can find our way to a better, more elevated kind of public discourse than the kind to which we've become accustomed. Thank you so much, Andres, for engaging in this conversation. Thank you, Michael, and thank you for leaving us on that high note. Um, we're all hoping that uh, you're right. We want to uh, thank Professor Michael Sandel for bringing his book, The Tyranny of Merit, to our LSE public event series. We want to thank everybody who joined us from many, many countries around the world. And um, I think we leave um, having been provoked to think deeply and in a fresh way about these very, very important topics. Thank you, everybody. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you.